my beautiful grief growers and welcome to Facebook Live Monday. Uh, first, before I do anything else, I want to just acknowledge that if you are here, if you are watching this, it means you have survived. Uh, yesterday was Mother's Day, which is notoriously a very hard holiday for me, as well as lots of other grievers in my grief growers community around the world, people who wanted to be mothers and can't be, couldn't be, had motherhood taken from them as an identity, people who have lost mothers or grieving mothers, mothers who have died or mothers who have been estranged or toxic or not a proper mother figure. So Mother's Day, for a lot of reasons, is really hard for a lot of people. And before we jump into the full-on Facebook Live today, I really want to let you know that if you're here, you have survived. And if you're watching this at a later date, when maybe Mother's Day wasn't yesterday, uh, you've survived anyway. You've woken up today, you've watched this video today, you have survived, physically survived, mentally, emotionally survived, whatever it is that you have gone through, whatever it was that yesterday held or a month ago held or a year ago held, you have survived, you are here. So, so yeah, um, a lot of people always ask me how I spend Mother's Day and I actually spent it working this year. I work for a restaurant to act as the undercurrent of, of money that supports me and supports me in the grief work that I do. So I don't ask my heart's work to make 100% of the money for me, it frees it up to be uh, a little more playful sense of uh, creativity that way and I don't know how to describe it other than the channel is more open because I don't force it to make money for me so what comes through in my grief is, is very true what I feel because I'm not asking it you know to pay the bills things like that so I did I did work at the restaurant yesterday met a, a ton of wonderful people who just kind of honored and represented really beautiful Mother's Days for me and and was supported by co-workers in a way that I wasn't expecting. I think part of that is because I emit such openness about my story, my grief, the work that I do. Uh, and part of it is just that I I work in a place with pretty amazing people and that's that's really neat. Uh, after that, I took myself to dinner, which is something that I think I don't know if I would have done that if my mom was here. I don't know if she would have come all the way from North Carolina to Chicago to visit me. I imagine she would have uh, some years to come see me, but I bought myself some flowers, which you can see behind me. I'll pick them up for you. Many of you know I was a florist uh, before I did grief recovery work, so I'll show off my flowers here for you today. Um, got a pretty wide variety in here, but um, I just wanted to do something to, to honor myself, honor her, honor our relationship together, and then we got a pizza. My mom and I got a pizza together. And, and that was just a really cool, really neat spot to be. If I had to create my own Mother's Day, it's not the Mother's Day I would want. I would rather have her here. I'd rather have my mom alive walking around on the planet. I wished with everything in me that I could have called yesterday. Instead, I was getting text messages from all of my, my relatives and my sister and my dad and, and you know friends from college and roommates and, and things like that. And it's... good enough is what I'll say today and and for a lot of you out there for all of you who are grieving sometimes good enough is good enough and it's 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 a tricky reality to say but but being supported in all of these ways is different than what I want as the ideal the thing I can no longer have it's not necessarily better it's not worse there's not a degree of goodness, badness, uh, you know, I, I can't measure it in terms of emotional and mental value to me, but I notice on these holidays, on these hard days, I am supported differently than how I would have been supported if my mom was around. So it's, it's, it was really fascinating and just uh, still continuing to process that, still continuing to run through that in my mind today. Um, secondly, this is going to be a little bit longer of a Facebook Live video today because I have a lot to tell you. Secondly, I am celebrating today because May 14th is the day, last year, May 14th, 2017, that I launched Coming Back. 
And when I launched Coming Back, the podcast, I launched the intro episode on May 14th and then uh, started with full-length episodes closer to the end of May, so I had a little piece for people to bite onto and then kind of other things continuing throughout the year. And so I'm celebrating a little bit today, officially one year of being a podcaster, one year of putting my voice into the world, putting these tools into the world, putting the stories of these other people out into the world, and it's it's very cool. It's... I. I say very cool and people are like, well, it's kind of flippant. And I'm like, no, I, I just uh, to be in this space and to be looking at a year's worth of material that has literally, hello, Gigi, at a year's worth of material that has literally come through me, flowed through me, integrated with the voices of other people kind of horizontally who are traveling these parallel paths and then putting it into the world for other people to see and absorb and learn from and grow from and and take on as their own truths in their own way has just been very very cool so softly processing and celebrating a lot of things today with you but the big thing that I want to talk about today the the real meat of what we're getting to today is the topic of anticipatory grief and I actually have had a couple of listeners write into me email me, you know, things of that nature, asking, have you experienced this? Is this normal? Is this common? Where does this show up? How does this show up? And the answer is yes. Kind of blanket statement, yes, anticipatory grief is normal and shows up in a lot of different ways in regards to our grief. So what anticipatory grief is, to be precise, is grieving before a loss actually occurs. So this loss is most commonly a death And anticipatory grief shows up a lot in terms of Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, things that take pieces of the people that we love but don't don't take them entirely in terms of death, in terms of a physical taking away from, but mental capacity, emotional capacity, memory, physical ability in terms of movement or fine motor movements or balance or cognition or being able to stand or, or being able to speak, things of that nature where you have all these small losses leading up to the big loss, the final loss that is death. That's one definition of anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief can also be what happens when our hearts and our minds start to prepare us for a loss to occur. And all of those emotions leading up to that are considered grief. And remember the base level definition of grief is the series, the collection of emotions that's experienced in regards to uh, the end of or the change in a normal pattern of behavior. So as soon as something changes and it's permanently shifted, it's no longer normal, or it's the end of something, something is coming to an end and you will not be able to be exactly the same where you were in the beginning as you are after, those moments incite grief emotions. So grief is not just sadness, it can be nostalgia, it can be regret, it can be guilt, it can be numbness, it can be anger, it can be depression, it can be all of these things kind of lumped in together. So anticipatory grief is feeling all of those things, but far before a loss actually occurs or what could be defined as a loss. So it's all these little tiny bite-sized losses that you're experiencing leading up to the big one. And you can start grieving people, I mean, years out. I've had people write me um, and say, I've been estranged from my father for 10 years, and so I'm grieving him actively, even though, you know, I I don't speak to him anymore. It's been four or five years. He's been diagnosed with something new. I don't keep up with him, and I know he's going to die one day, but I grieved him the moment that we uh, broke ties. The woman that actually wrote me as inspiration for this week's podcast, um, she's grieving her grandmother who has Alzheimer's, and so she's losing these little pieces of her, her, her memory, you know, fine motor function, the things that we lose when we lose, you know, mental capacity, ability, in kind of pre-grieving, preparing for her grandmother's death. And yes, this is something that's really, really normal. I've never expounded upon it in a really big way. If you're looking to catch like little pieces of it, you can go back to episode three of Coming Back, which was one of the very first ones I did, and uh, talk to a listener who wrote in whose father had Parkinson's. And And that was pretty interesting because I validated anticipatory grief as something that's neither good nor bad, uh, but something that just happens as a result of knowing that these small losses are occurring and that our loved ones are eventually going to die. Um, So a lot of what I pulled from from this episode came from a really neat article by the folks over at What's Your Grief, which is a a grief blog, a, a podcast 
duo. It's two girls who are both in the mental health profession together. And and they wrote this article. If you go over to whatsyourgrief.com and just um, search Alzheimer's or search anticipatory grief, you'll find exactly the article that I'm talking about and you can read it for yourself. But, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit of what I want to talk about is kind of the top three things that distinguish anticipatory grief from other types of grief. So there's grief before, and that's all anticipatory grief, and then there's grief after, and that's just what society would consider grief. So anticipatory grief often has, first of all, like a caregiver element, where either you, somebody you love, is taking care of a person who you all know is about to die. Um, So whether they've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, any kind of mental uh, illness or kind of something that takes ability away from them or speech or memory, things like that where they need to be assisted in some way. There's a caregiver element there where you are, for lack of better phrasing, kind of roped in to being a part of these little losses, Um, whether it's taking care of them day to day, visiting them once a week somewhere new, writing them often or kind of supporting them in daily tasks like paying the bills, getting dressed, things of that nature. There's often a caregiver element and that in itself is a loss because once you sign on to become a caregiver, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, you leave behind the life that you knew before. So this is a change in the normal. So grief happens automatically there. But as a result of the caregiver element, and this is the second point I'll come to about anticipatory grief, is that there's often a relief element that comes in. And this is where a lot of people tend to feel shame or feel guilt or feel kind of twisted uh, about grieving in advance of a loss because they're like, oh, now that the loss has happened, I feel relieved. Is this normal? Because for the most part, when the rest of us who are not experiencing anticipatory grief find out about a loss, the emotions that come up are shock, anger, rage. How could this happen? I'm so surprised. I'm horrified. I can't believe it. All of a sudden they were here and then they were not. But with anticipatory grief, when you're watching a slow decline, whether it's leading up to a death or divorce papers, you know, being finalized or a major move, when you're watching the lead up to that, when it finally happens, there's a sense of, okay, I don't have to, to, to deal with that anymore. I don't have this massive overhead anxiety kind of just lording over the everyday about the big loss happening because it's finally happened, whether it's your loved one being out of pain or not carrying this anxiety of, oh my God, will I even wake up the next morning after this happens? Or even just the fact that you are no longer a caregiver. So this strain, this these minimal resources that you've been operating on for however long, you don't have that as your reality anymore. So this is there is this element of relief of, oh, they're out of pain. Oh, I don't have to watch them this way. Oh, my family's not strained. Oh, my time's not strained. Oh, all of these other things that are elements of relief. They're in a better place if that's something that you believe, or they have finally gotten the peace that they had been longing for. They'd been in a lot of, you know, either mental pain or physical pain for a while. There's a relief element often that comes with anticipatory grief that can cause people kind of a lot of guilt. And I just want to normalize and validate that for you today, that whatever kind of relief you're feeling in association to grief is totally and 100% normal. And then the last thing I kind of want to touch on with anticipatory grief that's interesting and kind of distinguishes it from anticipatory grief and then grief after a loss has occurred is that anticipatory grief does not change, impact, reduce the amount of pain that you feel after a loss. So kind of the way I describe this on the podcast is not like a lot of people believe there's like a bucket of loss and you feel like a certain capacity of grief. Like maybe if I anticipate for this much grief, like 30, 40, 50%, then when the loss occurs, I'll only have that remaining like 60% to deal with. And, and unfortunately that's just not the case. So with anticipatory grief, you can't like whoop, like scoot, you can't scoot grief out of the way. You can't pre grieve and then the loss occurs and you don't grieve anymore. When you grieve, you end up grieving for the rest of your life. And that's something I teach a lot on coming back and through these Facebook lives and things like that. But with anticipatory grief, you're grieving a lot of different things before a loss occurs. And then when the loss occurs, you grieve a whole other set of things. So before the loss, you're grieving, again, all these things I'm listing, like loss of memory, loss of motor function, loss of, you know, speech, loss of ability, loss of, you know, 
financial tracking, loss of a home if they need to be moved somewhere different. And then when the loss finally does occur, if it's a death especially, you're, you're mourning the fact that the person is no longer on this planet. You can no longer touch them, hold them, be with them, be close to them, talk to them, hear their voice, things of that nature. And they will not get to experience things into the future with you. So the hopes, dreams, expectations, things that we talk about in other podcasts are gone. So you don't scoot grief out of the way because you grieve it in advance. You just grieve different things on both sides of the loss. Um, so if you're experiencing anticipatory grief today, there's three things I want you to keep in mind. Um, the first of which is that it's normal. And I've said this a lot during this Facebook Live broadcast on the podcast this week. Anticipatory grief is our, our bodies, our minds, our hearts way of preparing us for an upcoming loss. It's thinking about all the things before they happen or pre-grieving all of these things because we know, intuitively we know, and our gut we know, and visually by, by looking at a person, by experiencing this in real life, we know that once they lose these ability, speech, memory, home, there's no turning back. For a lot of anticipatory grief, it's like these are the, you're seeing the last pieces of people being pulled away from them as they're still alive and walking on this earth. Whether it's like ability to swallow or ability to remember your kids' names or ability to move around on their own. You're watching people change permanently in the last moments of their lives. And there is grief in that. There is grief in that. And I really just want to normalize that for you today because a lot of people think they're not actually dead. I have no right to be grieving this early. And I'm like, of course you do. End of or change in what is normal to you. Anything that falls under that description can cause and be a trigger for grief feelings to occur. So absolutely, it's normal. Second thing I want you to remember is that you do not have to listen to the at-leasters. And these, these, this, these folks are one of my least favorite people. Least favors are my least favorite people. At leasters are my least favorite people uh, in the entire world. Because what they do is minimize grief, usually without meaning to. And it, it kind of goes something like this, where you're, you're grieving the fact that your grandmother doesn't remember your name because she has Alzheimer's. She's still alive. And some one of your coworkers says, well, at least she's still alive. My grandmother died, blah, 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 blah. And then they go tell their story. Or you're grieving the fact that you're having to move houses because you've got a divorce coming up and you're waiting for these divorce papers to, to finally, you know, be finalized, to go through. And you say, I'm so sad we're losing the house. I'm so sad we're losing that picture of life that we used to have. Well, at least you still have your husband sending you child support. Like, this is something that we call in the grief recovery method intellectually true emotionally not helpful and 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 these statements of at least are just invalidating of your experience of losing because i'm acknowledging today for you and other caregivers other people experiencing anticipatory grief will acknowledge for you as well that you are losing something you are losing something you will never be able to get back and you need to surround yourself with people who are going to acknowledge that for you so part of ignoring the at leasters, that's kind of one half of it, is going and embracing people who will validate these losses for you, whether it's a caregiver community uh, group, whether it's a private group on Facebook, the Grief Growers Garden is a great option if you're in the process of watching someone die or waiting for a loss to happen. We are a great little group of people to support you through that. And if you don't see a group that fits exactly what you're looking for, start your own. Because I promise you that you are not alone in whatever loss you're getting ready to experience. Whether it's getting ready to become an empty nester or losing you know, somebody to Alzheimer's. I guarantee there are people all over the world. And the internet makes it so easy now to, to find a group, start a group, join a community of people who will validate those losses for you. Um, last thing I have written down here is... A memory of anticipatory grief is that in anticipatory grief, you are not giving up on the person who is dying. You are not ready for them to die. A lot of people are like, if I'm grieving before the loss, does that mean I'm ready? Does that mean I want them to die? Does that mean I'm giving up on them? Does it mean there's no hope? It's no. You're acknowledging that something is changing permanently forever about the person you love or about the relationship that you love or about the pet that you love, or about the place that you love. Something is getting ready to change permanently or is already changing in small pieces permanently 
and you are acknowledging that. You are not giving up on the person. You are not ready for them to die. You don't love them any less than you did before. It's, it's just your heart and your mind preparing you to lose these things and acknowledging that you're losing these little pieces beforehand. So with anticipatory grief, kind of the last little bit that I want to leave you with today is what are you going to do about it? Because this is uh, kind of a process that we go through and coming back is acknowledgement and then action. There's a little another Facebook Live video I did called Acknowledgement is Not Enough. That was one of my favorite pieces where you can acknowledge your grief. You can see it there. Look, I'm looking at my grief and kind of examining it top to bottom, studying it, whatever. But then you take your seeing of grief and the best way to continue living in the world is to morph it, to switch it, to move it, to kind of what I'm, what's the word I'm looking for? Like transmute it. I'm almost getting like an alchemy visual here into something that is tangible, some kind of action that you produce through yourself in the real world. So you see your grief, you acknowledge your grief. Now, what are you going to do about it? So you have words now based on the podcast this week, based on this Facebook live, I am experiencing anticipatory grief. Now, what am I going to do about it? And you can seek therapy. You can find the community groups I was talking about, but but one of my favorite exercises, and I outlined this really well on the podcast, so if you want like a long form version of it, go listen to the podcast. I never remember where the link is. It's somewhere <laughs> up, down. I don't remember. Um, but there's an exercise that I have on there where you look at the time you have left with this person. You look at the time you have left with this relationship. You look at the time left with this pet, with this place, if you're making a major move, at this job. You, you look at the time that you have left because anticipatory grief is majorly about time. And you say, if everything went exactly how I wanted to go before this loss occurred, how would I behave? How would I act? What would I do or stop doing to honor the fact that this loss is about to take place? And throw out some suggestions on there, obvious things like writing letters or visiting more often or bringing a tape recorder so you can record their voice, sing a song with them for the last time or so you always have that memory to capture. With pets, it's, you know, forming new rituals like getting doggy ice cream every Friday when you know your pet has a terminal illness and is going to die, creating some kind of ritual there or going to the same park once a week or every afternoon to play or kind of taking them along in the car with you when maybe they can't move so much anymore, things like that. Or if it's if you're moving from somewhere and you're not going to be able to return for a while, something like Gretchen Rubin talks in The Happiness Project a lot about becoming a tourist in your own city and kind of writing down all the places you'd like to go, things you'd like to see. Do you want to throw a going away party? Like, small things like that that you think about, oh, that'd be nice if I did that. But now that you're acknowledging that anticipatory grief is a reality in your life, this is something that you're feeling, this is something that you're going through, and you're kind of in it for the long haul, you and anticipatory grief are kind of, I called it on the podcast, like a power couple. Now, what are you going to do with this information? How are you going to use this to your benefit? And don't don't get me wrong here. You can come up with the ideal scenario. You can write all these things down and you could experience more losses. All of a sudden, your family members might, na- Maddie, might not be able to remember you. All of a sudden, you know, they might lose physical ability and you might not be able to go on that last family vacation. But you create your ideal scenario and then in this anticipatory grief, in this pre-loss kind of hovering, kind of suspended period, you have something to aim for. You have something to like look at and like potentially try to grasp and then when the loss does happen you're like we got as close as we could we did as much as we could and granted that's not consolation for a loss when you're grieving there is no consoling i have just lost something and i am grieving but you have full knowledge and and just the outright mm, like personal validation that you know that you did the best you could with the time, the information, the resources, the ability, the money, the talents you had. You created your ideal because of anticipatory grief. Like this is what I want to do with the time I have left. Ideally, this would how every day of my life would go leading up until this moment or every month of my life would go, every year of my life, living with them like this and me like this. What do I want that to look like? And then when they die, when the move happens, when the divorce is final, when the pet dies, you know that you acted, behaved, you followed through. This was an alignment. This, this mind, heart, spirit, and then physical action, manifestation, connection, the acknowledgement to the action connection was full and was valid. 
and had your best intentions, your best ideals, your best goals for the relationship at heart. So you and anticipatory grief are a power couple. Now, you're working together, you're feeding off each other because anticipatory grief does not go away until this loss happens. And then you experience another kind of grief, you shift gears. So what are you going to do with it? You got the information now, what are you going to do with it? So that's, that's my big question to you today, grief growers with anticipatory grief. And I thank you so much, listener, for writing in. Uh, we'll keep you anonymous per your request. But this is, this is a really big topic to cover because anticipatory grief, if it's not affecting you now, it will affect you or somebody that you love, somebody within your sphere in, in the future. I wrote uh, on my most recent Instagram post, if you're not brokenhearted now, you're going to be. And that's not a threat. That's not, <laughs> that's not me wishing ill upon you, your life, your world, your family. Um, but I've, I've seen it. I've lived it. If you're not brokenhearted now, one day you will be. And you'll need these tools. You'll need these questions to ask yourself. Because one day, anticipatory grief, grief in general, will be your reality. So what are you going to do with it? Yeah. So just holding a lot of space for you guys today. Processing a lot. Post, post Mother's Day one-year podcast diversary. Yeah, anticipatory grief. What are you getting ready to lose? And what are you going to do about it? Yeah, good stuff. A um, couple things coming up. I know this coming Monday, I believe a week from today on the 21st. Let me check my calendar really quick. Mm -hmm. Yes, this coming Monday on the 21st, I'm hosting my monthly Patreon Ask Me Anything Hangout. You can find out more about that in the events section on Facebook or by jumping over to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. And this is an exclusive kind of one-on-one -on -one hour long hangout time, which is live like this is. And anyone who's pledging $33 or more per month gets this exclusive time with me. It's like having a therapy session once a month, uh, but with me. And you can ask me questions about the grief that you're going through, how to cope, resources, or uh, ask for a friend as well, book recommendations, you know, insider things about the podcast or talking to guests that I might know or might have kept secret from the show. Great things to ask. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for my emails, you certainly can. Shelbyforsythia.com and scroll all the way to the bottom of the page and sign up for email updates. And, and yeah, that's all I have for you today. I'm coming at you from a place of hmm, a deep well of wisdom. Just a deep spot of knowing that we are all here. We've all been here. We're all going to be here. So it's kind of this continuum of grief. Yeah. So I see you. I am proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world. And I love you so, so much. Because even through grief, we are growing. I'll see you next week.